it's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello and welcome to the show. Today my guest is Ken Thorison. Ken's an author, speaker, consultant, and principal of the Acumen Management Group. Ken, good morning. Uh, Good morning. Great to be with you. Well, thanks for joining me. So rather than have me read off your standard bio, why don't you just take a minute, introduce yourself to the audience, tell us what you do and who you do it for. Terrific. Uh, Well, for the last 18 years, we've been providing consulting services and platform uh, programs for primarily the technology area in the small business marketplace. Uh, We've worked with major vendors from Microsoft, Cisco, down to individual resellers and partners and small business people outside of the technology sector area. Mm -hmm. Primarily, I'm focused around sales leadership issues. We look at our clients as if we were the vice president of sales and figure out what's working, what's not, and how to position their organizations for growth. Got it. So how'd you get your own start in sales? Well, it's interesting. Right out of college, um, I interviewed uh, in college for uh, sales positions uh, and was luckily uh, hired and spent uh, uh, four four years with an organization that really uh, did an excellent job in those days training people. Which one was that? At the time, it was a company called Burroughs Computers, and they are now called Unisys. I didn't realize. I'm a Burroughs guy. Is that right? Yeah, okay. I didn't know that you started Burroughs. And uh, we spent a lot of time training, which was great, formally uh, in Detroit. And uh, so I, I was really blessed to be not only well-managed because they had good management teams, but I also was uh, thankful and grateful to go through a variety of sales training programs, both fundamentals as well as advanced sales training. And do you remember Lee Boy? Absolutely. <laughs> 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 so just for the audience that was a at that time was a I'm not sure it was on VHS I think it was a real to real film they showed of this uh guy that was sort of their sales training videos they used that uh gosh sort of like a fundamentalist pastor I'd almost say right sort of an evangelical type type guy uh he was he was from louisiana and he talked about mr big ears yeah and made to listen more effectively a uh, fact uh, i was vice president of sales running a, a channel a large software company and we actually used some of his material I and mean, updated material for some fundamental basic sales training for our reseller so <laughs> i i know him well uh, <laughs> so what was the impetus for you to start your own sales consulting business i mean what were the problems you saw you know, in the marketplace that weren't being addressed that you thought you could address with your business? Interesting. Uh, well, about I had been running as a vice president of sales uh, uh, an international software company uh, with resellers for about eight, eight and a half years. And I realized during that tenure that where I had strong sales managers, I had strong resellers or dealers or channel partners. Um, and where I didn't, uh, I didn't have a very strong organization. So I started a national sales management association for my channel only. And I realized that that was kind of fun. I really enjoyed that. And we spent a lot of time growing the organization around that. And I said, you know, there's a lot of people doing sales training, but nobody really focused around what generally is the weak link in most organizations. Um, so after eight and a half nine years of uh, traveling extensively, uh, living in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the time, I thought, I think I'll start my own business. So I started my business right out of the chute uh, with uh, no contracts or nothing in in place. And uh, it took off really well. And I've been now very happy. I live in the South at the moment, but it's uh, been a fast 18 years for sure. So, yeah, you're an entrepreneur. So what's been the biggest sales challenge for you growing your own business? I think... Uh, I learned very early on that uh, in this particular kind of business, professional services, that some people fail because they get wrapped up in a project and forget the prospect. Um, And so I learned very early on in reading and talking to other people that you need to spend 25% of your time always looking at your pipeline, prospecting, looking for the next opportunity. Um, So I think it's that's an important element for any small business 
is to understand the dynamics of pipeline management, lead opportunity, and how to prospect uh, effectively and how to build relationships. So in your work and the companies you work with, is what do you see as sort of the biggest or most consistent problems relative to prospect development and business development, new business development, which seems to be the, the bugaboo for most small businesses? Well, it's changed a lot in the last three to five years, maybe, uh, because of voicemail and because of oh, everybody doing certain things. And the biggest issue is twofold. Uh, Sales people are not very creative or marketing is not very creative in helping the company or helping the salesperson stand out in the marketplace. And number two, they tend not to have a consistent program. One of the first things we do when we look at organizations who are struggling and in clients we get involved in, we get involved in uh, organizations who are startup brand new or we get involved in organizations that have stalled out and they could be $50 million in sales. Um, is they don't have a consistent program of weekly, monthly marketing events, programs, uh, campaigns, etc. They go up and down. Uh, and so they either have a poor message and they have inconsistent levels of prospecting activity. And so, and I agree that consistency is, is key in all of that. Um, so how do you help them achieve this consistency? Because I agree, I, I, in my work, very similar profile companies that I work with, especially the ones that have stalled, and that consistency has always been the problem. Yeah, and in, in, depending upon the organization, from a salesperson's mentality, we have something we call the 2020 plan, where, and I don't need to get into the details with you now, but it's a program that every week the salesperson sends out 20 postcards to 20 different people. Hmm. And the sec- second week they send another second postcard to the same 20 people in the third week they call those 20 people but they have to do that every week to build up the activity very simple program but it forces the salesperson into prospecting so uh, so you're actually team. still in this this day and age still using physical postcards not email uh exactly and the reason is it uh everybody uses email and it's easy to delete uh very the, the postcards are unique today uh, in the old days, everybody threw them away and they didn't use them. Today, they stand out. Oversized postcards. Uh, is a, it's a kind of old school. But I found out that email blasts don't work because people either have spam filters or they are deleted easily by the person without even reading the front line. Right. Um, and so we try to mix it up uh, and do some things that are different. Uh, the key issue is not to do a, a thousand names on an email blast because the salesperson will never have time to follow those up. Small. Exactly. Bits. I talk a lot about pizza in my speaking uh, area where I lay out the whole program in eight different slices, but you can only eat one slice at a time. So I like to keep it uh, lunchable for the salesperson. Now, on the marketing side… Well, I think uh, that's – before we move on, I, I think that's just great advice for people who are listening is, is you know, maybe they didn't appreciate it. We're talking about you know, sending physical postcards. And now there's services you can use that can help automate some of that. I don't know if you do that or you do handwritten ones, but you know, we tend to think we just get so lockstep, you know, we're in sort of lockstep with this thought that it has to be a technological solution to everything we do. And the thing with postcards, I mean, <laughs> part of the reason I love it is I did that back in my first sales job at Burroughs. I mean, that's, that's how I had a routine that every week I was sending out postcards to a certain number of prospects to invite them to come to my branch office for a demonstration. Exactly. And, and that's how I built my pipeline. And I talk about that in my latest book. I mean, that, that was my prospecting methodology. That's why I said it's old school, but it's new school to uh, the market today. Um, and a you know, lazy salesperson will set up an email blast and send it out. Uh, the smart salesperson thinks about creativity, persistence uh, in that area. Now, from a marketing perspective, we do a lot of events and we, we help them think about thought leadership concepts where it's not to come in and see my product or come in and let me get an appointment for you. We like to schedule uh, an event the first Thursday of every month as an example for breakfast uh, where we'll have a topic that would be pertinent to the prospects. So Mm -hmm. this gives gives a salesperson a reason to dial and call people or send a postcard, invite them to our executive forum 730 Thursday morning at the certain restaurant. And we'll have a speaker – That'll speak about a topic that's pertinent to the prospect, but not a product push. Right. So if you're a 
so let's put this in context. Let's say if you're a local small business that, uh, I don't know, could be a, give me an example of one of your clients maybe that's, that's done something. Good example. I, had, I worked with a, a company that was in the restaurant equipment business. They would sell equipment to a restaurant uh, from a walk-in freezer to forks and knives. Mm -hmm. um, we did a variety of programs for chefs. And we would have guest chefs come in and speak about the latest trends. We'd have a nutritionist come in and speak about nutrition. So restaurant owners could come in and learn about um, something of interest to them. And marketing, we'd had a, we had a marketing person come in and talk about how to market restaurants. Now, it was sponsored by my client, and it was obvious that it was put on by my client. But we attracted people to the event to learn and that's the secret in today's world of differentiating prospecting is that people are going to know more about you because of your website. They're going to know about the industry, what they have. But people want to learn more about how to run their business more effectively. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do a lot of work around uniqueness from a thought leadership perspective. Right. And it brings, brings gravity to the, to the buyer. Exactly. And so in this case, you know, the, the exposure or the cost or the investment on the part of, uh, of your client that was putting on this monthly breakfast was the cost of a breakfast for 20 people or something like that. Exactly. And, and, uh, it w and the marketing associated with that. We sure. don't believe in what a lot of people call lunch and learns. Um, we found out from some basic uh, experience that net new prospects will come to a breakfast meeting rather than come to a lunch meeting. Uh, it just is in the middle of the day. It's drive there, come back. It's a two-hour kind of commitment. Right. Whereas in the morning, we can attract people in the morning. You know, rotary clubs in the United States, the fastest-growing rotary clubs are breakfast clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it makes sense to do uh, that kind of prospecting and that kind of an event in the morning. That's a great suggestion for people listening. And sort of take it a step further then is how then do you work with the sales people of that client that's let's say is doing that that monthly event <clears throat> to reflect that thought leadership in their own personal platforms well uh now I, I don't need to get into the social media side now but that's an important element but part of what the, it also helps the salesperson uh, become a value add individual to their prospects because now the salesperson can stop by uh, and leave a calendar of the next four events that we have. They're planned out four months ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So all four events are planned out so people can put them on their calendar. The salesperson can drop that off. They're not pushing product. They're providing advice. So the consultant or the salesperson starts to move away from a product pusher to someone the customer may want to see or the prospect may want to see because all of a sudden they've built a conversation. Now the salesperson has to be able to attend those events and has to come away with a learning experience themselves about how to market a restaurant or what nutrition is or how to use a certain uh, way to present your food to in improve the presentation uh, so that they can speak to that level as well. Mm. Yes. Now, if they're in a vertical market and they're tight within a vertical market, then certainly the salesperson needs to be able to understand the business challenges and issues that that prospect faces. Well, I wanted to bring that point up because you know I love the name of your company, the Acumen Management Group, and there's a lot of talk in sales thought leadership circles these days about salespeople need to have more business acumen. Uh, how do you help them with that? Oh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> well, we're working with a, a large technology company right now and have for about three years. We developed something called Smart Business Roadmap, and I won't get into the detail. I don't need to get into the details, but that's essentially what the program is. Uh, the secret uh, sauce where most people today fail, especially the younger salespeople, is in, number one, developing a personal relationship with a prospect, sharing something uniquely or un understanding who that person is. Uh, number two, understanding how to perform a discovery, an effective questioning process to understand the business challenges that that prospect faces, uh, what the business strategies are of that company and that individual or multiple individuals, and then what I call connecting the dots, understanding what they're saying, understanding how my product or professional services is going to solve their problems or challenges, and then coming back to what the benefits are 
that that customer is going to receive from providing that. Now, again, somewhat old school, but what we found is technology, and especially in the younger organ, uh, younger salespeople, aren't into that. And customers still buy an emotion. I always say there's three rules in selling. Emotion, emotion, emotion. Uh, <laughs> and you have to be able to understand it and provide it and give it and build it up in the prospect's mind. Right. Some great advice from Ken Thorson about just some great tactical ways that sales teams can prospect for new business. may seem a little old school, but it's so old. It's actually, it's new and completely differentiating, which is so important. You're actually going to get and attract the attention of your prospects with your message. So we're going to take a short break and come back with Ken. Some more great thoughts about how to amp up your sales. But before we go, Ken, I'm going to pose a hypothetical scenario to you and we'll get your answer after the break. So you have a client that's, uh, you know, sales is stagnated. They've hired you as a new sales manager. They're really urgent need to make a change. So when you came on board, what would be the two things you'd do the first week that would have the biggest impact? And we'll talk about that after the break. I'm Andy Paul with Ken Thorson. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a 1,000 companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on-demand service, which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. So welcome back. My guest today is Ken Thorison. You can find Ken online at Acumen Management. Actually, it's an abbreviation of management, MGMT, so A-C-U-M-E-N-M-G-M-T.com. And so, Ken, let's talk about the scenario I posed before the break. New manager brought into a company of sales have stagnated. Urgency to make a change is really there. What could you do in the first week? What two things would you do in the first week that would have the biggest impact? Great question. Um, I've seen it happen, and, and obviously there could be some variables in, in the scenario, but uh, the two things that hit me first based on your question, number one, uh, on the sales meeting <clears throat> that I have the first Monday, if I'm having Monday morning sales meetings, I would change <clears throat> what was done. Now, if the sales manager is coming in from the outside, uh, he would have or she would have really tried to understand what was done in the past. If they come from the existing organization, they would know what was done. But I would change the tempo. I would change the format and the agenda of the sales meeting. Second thing I would do, um, I would make sure that I made a sale, if, if it was possible in size of the organization, I'd make sales calls every day with different salespeople because my job would be there to evaluate the market what's being done, how effective those salespeople are, and begin to understand the sales process. And perhaps using some business acumen, help close some opportunities to drive that revenue. Uh, those are the first two things that in the first week I would do. After that, you can get much more tactical in sure. what you can do to drive the business. That's a good answer because you also, if you make the sales calls, you're going to understand what the customers are thinking about you as well. Exactly. That's yeah, a good, good answer. And, and we asked this question just so, you know, if people have been listening to this, you know, we asked the same question of all the guests that come on board. And the point is, is that, you know, you don't always need to go outside and hire an expert like Ken to help you with this. So it's certainly a great idea, but yeah, you know, there are things you could do yourself. And, you know, part of that could be, as I said, if you bring a new manager from within the organization, change the tempo, make sure you're engaging your customers and so on in a way that you really understand what their concerns are. So, you write extensively about high-performance sales teams. So in your, your mind, what is a high-performance sales team? Well, I think it probably fits in a couple of different areas. Uh, certainly activity levels is high-performance. I think culture is an important element of high-performance sales teams. There's a culture of expectation, accountability, um, and success and, and camaraderie from that team perspective. And certainly high-performance organizations uh, really are – what I call market dominant. Uh, they're the team in town that everybody wants to be on. They're the team in, in the industry that everybody looks up to. Uh, they're the, the team that hires best, trains best, uh, and are actively driving uh, market dominance from that perspective. And does it start with the hiring? Absolutely. Um, I believe that. I, my first book was How to Hire a High-Performance Sales Team. 
um, it, because number one, it tends to be the biggest challenge in any organization. Yeah, if you hire, I always say that uh, C, C sales managers hire C people, B managers hire C people. Uh, if you're an A sales manager, you hire A people uh, because you know what you're looking for. It starts with trying to identify what I call the five work experiences that I want out of that team and the five uh, characteristics, personalities of the person. So there's 10, 10 words we try to come up with that describe what we're looking for. A lot of people hire and they hire people who don't fit those categories and then they wonder what happened. So next step is the onboarding process, which is a critical success factor for anybody that I see most people failing at. They've not built a tactical, prescriptive, you know, two week, three week, six week onboarding process to get that person up to speed on products, services, company, industry, and uh, in sales management, we like to say inspect what you expect. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not inspected to see if they can stand up and uh, articulate the company's value proposition. In our onboarding process, generally the third week, that salesperson has to stand up in front of the president of the company, if, if potential or a vice president, and actually sell the company and sell the products and services. Uh, so it's a very important element. And then ongoing training um, on a monthly basis is critical. In our clients, we like to recommend that they build a three-month or quarterly sales training program that covers sales skills, product and service skills, CRT, CRM operation knowledge, and industry awareness. So I want to get back to the the five and five, the five the five and five words, um, or the ten words in total about uh, the characteristics or the attributes you're looking for in candidates for high performance. Give us a sample of some of those. Um, well, let's say for an example, uh, and I work in the technology sector a lot, but um, I want someone who has uh, three to five years of experience selling into the vertical market that I'm in, say healthcare. Mm -hmm. I want someone who has can sell in a regional environment, meaning covering three or five states, that so they understand if they live somewhere how they're going to cover uh, remote states. I want someone who has uh, taken a professional sales training course and has been selling for three years or more, if that's an example. So that's what I would call work experiences, mm -hmm. <clears throat> defining what your successful salespeople have and what you're looking for. It helps you write the ad if you're placing an ad online or in the newspaper or whatever you're doing more effectively as well. Number two, from a personal characteristic perspective, it could be I want someone who can uh, communicate well, articulate well, can stand up and present my uh, product and service, if I have to stand up and present to a board of directors or I have to present to a management team, uh, I want someone who maybe uh, has the ability to write, which is a big issue these days. Um, and we may need to validate that from a, a capability, certainly from an energy level, from an ethical perspective, uh, maybe even a, whether teamwork is important or not. Mm -hmm. In some, some organizations, I can hire uh, what people would call a cowboy, someone who's independent, go out and do the job, turn in the orders and keep going. In other organizations, I need a salesperson who can work with two or three people on a collaborative team and be able to work in that functionality. So it, you look at what you need in that person, in that role, and be able to find the characteristics of, of that person. So how do you coach managers to not be lazy in their hiring? Because it's, it's, all well and good to have a great job description and you know bring in a bunch of candidates, but too often I'm sure you've seen this as well. Yeah, it's not an easy process. Yeah, you know, they tend to hire the first person they fall in love with, and oftentimes you know they don't sufficiently validate or verify qualifications and so on. So, how do you work with your clients to put a little more rigor into that process? Two two steps. Uh, number one, we actually tell people that for every one person you hire, you have to interview five candidates. Number two. We actually tell them, and it's true, that in the first 45 seconds or a minute, you're going to make a decision whether you like this person or not. And you're, the way you ask questions and, uh, and ha handle the interview is based upon that first minute. So hold back. Be skeptical. And number three, uh, we have a set of interviewing questions that we provide um, that that person is trained to read the question the way it's written, not to uh, just kind of throw it out there. Number uh, four, 
we actually have an interview scorecard. So at the end of the interview, I would grade you, grade you, Andy, one to five on 15 different words, including the 10 that I already talked mm-hmm, about. Mm-hmm. So I can get a numerical score on rather than saying, well, I like this person. Well, I gave him a 55. What did you give him? Or well, give her a 47. You know, why is there a point differential? Number five, maybe we have at least three people interview each candidate. And we have an interview process that we've built so that there's a telephone interview, there's some face-to-face interviews, there's a salesperson online assessment tool that we use. Uh, And so just like in a good sales process that is well mapped out for typical reasons, you have a interviewing process for the same reasons. If you follow your sales process, odds are you may win. If you follow an interviewing process, odds are you're going to hire better. Got it. Great advice from Ken Thorison, Acumen Management Group. So again, we're going to move into the last section of our show, which is some rapid-fire questions and answers. You can give one-word answers, <laughs> or you can elaborate if you wish. It's completely up to you. All right. So, all right. So the first one, what's the most powerful sales tool in your arsenal? I think credibility, not only because of years of experience, but uh, people can look at my body of work and uh, I can give a variety of examples of where uh, and how we were successful. Name one sales tool slash application that you use personally for sales or sales management that you can't live without. Act. Okay, your CRM system. Yes. Who is your sales role model? Interesting. I have, I have three. Um, one was a Boy Scout camp counselor. Uh, he was the head of the Boy Scout camp. Uh, number two was a, a person who hired me, and I worked for him for eight or nine years. Uh, and three was another person who hired me. He was the president of the company, and he was the first man who trained me how to be a sales manager. What's the one book that every salesperson should read? Besides mine and yours. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's a great question because there's so many good books out there. Um, depending upon the product you sell or service you sell, that changes. Now, give, us, believer. give us one uh, yeah. that you think. Um, I like one that um, Mahan Kahalsa wrote, um, and it's talk, he talks about, and I'm looking for it right now in my library, but it's, uh, it's all about building relationships, and I'll look for it dramatically here in a moment. And one that's very interesting was uh, how to master the art of the sell. And if you follow Donald Trump, <laughs> His book is really good. All right. All right. So what's your favorite music to listen to to psych yourself up for a sales call? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Uh, I live in Knoxville, Tennessee, so it must be country music. <laughs> is that like a state law? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're listening to all of your music choices. So what's the first sales activity you do every day? I think the first thing I do every day is, is hit my outlook and see what popped up. I have a to-do list that I, I make the night before, and I double-check that. What's your definition of value in sales? Being a resource for my client beyond the products and services that I deliver. What's your favorite social media tool? Hootsuite. What do you do to keep fit and healthy? Uh, I use a tread climber um, from Bowflex. Have you seen that on TV? I have on TV, yeah. It's a, it's a hell of a machine. I call it the beast. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one that can go up to like a 40% incline or something? Uh, yeah, and, and it's a treadmill and a stepper and everything all combined. Wow, okay. So the one question you get asked most frequently by salespeople is? What do I need to do to be successful? What's your answer? Um, I talk about creativity, persistence, and uh, work habit. Yeah, I love that creativity. And I stress Salespeople, you got to think. This is a thinking person's profession. This is not, you know, if you want to have a rote job, go work on assembly line somewhere. Exactly. The most successful salespeople are creative. The cool news, and I, I talk about this in my keynote program, is creativity can be learned. And you can increase your pro, uh, creativity quotient um, by a variety of areas. Yeah, it's a skill. Definitely. Definitely a skill that can be improved. So last question for you. So what do you do every day to improve yourself, whether in life or in, in work? Read. Uh, I read a business book. I read a sales book. I read a business book. I usually have two books going at a time. And what do you read non-business-wise? Um, I, I, I read fun books. I'll read uh, uh, CIA 
mystery movies, mm-hmm. mystery books, I guess I would call them. Yeah, thrillers, Brad, right? Yeah. Brad, Brad Thor, some of those kind of guys. Yeah, me too. Good, good, good escapism. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today, Kim. It's been a great show. And how can people learn more about you? Well, they certainly can go to my website, acumenmanagement.com. You can spell out management fully. Uh, you can certainly Google Ken Thorson. And my uh, blog is called salesmanagementguru.com, salesmanagementguru.com. Someone came up to me one time and said, you know, you're my guru for sales management. I said, well, okay, I'll use that. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, you can find me on my blog, certainly uh, anywhere on, the, on social media. All right, great. Well, I really appreciate you joining us. And remember, for people listening, that if you really want to accelerate your sales, you want to amp up your business, then you have to deliberately, I use the word deliberately, deliberately learn something new every day that will empower you to achieve your goals. And I think we accomplished that today. So, Ken, thank you very much. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.